Today, we're going to talk about the two presidential candidates, Trump and Harris. And Greg wants to tell everybody about the idea you got for this. So what we've done is go and look for the best videos. Some of these are going to be recent and some are going to be dated, but they're still the same person and it's still the same baseline. And the intent is to give you the ability to analyze the behavior of these candidates, whether they're in a debate or an interview. You don't have to have them talking to each other because what we're going to see is you're going to see them when they're evasive and when they're straight talking on a complex issue. So each one of them will get a hard question from an adversarial style or tone, and they'll respond to that. And we'll look for how they typically maneuver away from it. And then uh, that for Harris, that's the border. For Trump, it's whether he will accept election results. Then they'll each get a question on a tough topic, but from a non-adversarial approach. And we get to see how they think and speak, even when something is a complex subject. There's one other topic I wanted to uh, talk to you about, but let me just quickly put a button. Okay. Do you have any plans to visit the border? I'm here in Guatemala today I, at some point. You know, I, we are going to the border. We've been to the border. So you, this whole this whole this whole thing about the border, we've been to the border. We've been to the border. You haven't been to the border. I, and I haven't been to Europe. And I mean, I don't I don't understand the point that you're making. I'm not discounting the importance of the border. Well, I, I mentioned it because I, even I, I know Republicans have certainly come at you on this. But Democratic Congressman Cuellar as a border district has said to the, you and the president, come. You need, I care you need to see about, this. Listen, I care about what's happening at the border. I'm in Guatemala because my focus is dealing with the root causes of migration. There may be uh, some who think that that is not important, but it is my firm belief that if we care about what's happening at the border, we better care about the root causes and address them. And so that's what I'm doing. All right, Greg, what do you got? So I'm going to start in a different way than I usually do. I'm going to give you a formula, and you can write these down, memorize these, whatever you want. You know, Come back to it and look at it, but I'm going to give you six steps for how she responds and six steps. That's five. But six steps for how she responds and six steps for how Trump responds. Let's start off with Kamala here by saying she tries to chaff and evade, but words fail her. You see it all the time when she's talking. Then she'll smile and nod to get agreement, often saying something that has no substance but is a ploy. We went to the border in this case. We'll see that she does that. And when she realizes she's losing, she gets kind of wooden in her movement, and you see her blink rate increase, and you can see fight or flight. Then she feigns misunderstanding. As she feigns misunderstanding, she then starts to get more nervous, and you see that laughter erupt. And that's a defensive mechanism that she's used over time. Then finally, for step six, she moves into the gravity of the situation of something important, some holy cloth that she can put around her. So she's saying, look, I'm doing something important, like we saw Clinton do when he said, I got to go back and do the people's work. So that's one, tries to chaff and redirect, but evades. I'm sorry. One, she tries to chaff and evade, but words fail her. Two, she smiles and nods to get agreement and says something without substance. Three. She realizes she's losing. We see wooden movement, fight or flight, and start to see that blink rate increase. Four, she feigns misunderstanding. Not every time, but often. Five, that laughter comes up, that explosive thing. And then six, she moves on to something that makes her wrapped in holy cloth take holy ground. If you follow that on every one of these videos you see her do, and she's doing that, it's because she's uncomfortable with the answer she has or she's poorly prepared. We'll see in a different video, she has a much different approach. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, the first thing we see that head shake, no, and then her classic pinch thing comes out. That upside down pinch. It's, it's the it's it's the same idea. She's trying to get specific, but Trump does it with his pinch like this. That's when he's being specific. So, and then she freezes like a statue right after that. I think she realizes what's happening. There, she's getting ready to get boxed in because when he brings up the border, she knows she's never been. She's she was the the border czar. There's an argument about that, but she was, because I looked it up, and she, she was assigned to be the border czar, and she'd never been to the border, and she knew that, so she knew this thing was, she needed to be careful in this arena, this guy, in this box he's setting up. So then she she usually speaks in these really weird, whimsical phrases when she's lost or doesn't know what she's talking about, and she she alights upon these things that are supposed to be profound, but it's it's things that make no sense. And so we see that a little bit in there. Not slammer. I'm just telling you what happens. Um, then then uh, she says, we've been to the border. Uh, we've been. She says, we've been to the border. She says border seven times or five times within seven seconds. Now, that's that's kind of that's tough to do. 
to, to pull that off and make that happen. Right. But she's, she's over again. It's, it's the whimsical answer she has with the laugh. And I think the laugh is when she's really uncomfortable. I think that's when she lets that go because it wastes time and it gives her a little bit of time to think. So I think that's what's happening there. And when he says, you've never been to the border, she answers and says, I've never been to Europe either. And th- that's when the laugh comes up. I don't know how that's, I don't, I don't, it makes no sense to me really what she, what she's, what she's talking about there. And she says, I, I don't understand the point you're making, but I think she does understand, but he's stung her and she's got, he's got her in the corner. He's got her boxed in and she, she can't get out of it. There's no way, there's no way out of that answer, no matter what you say. So she starts going to the, to the reasons that people are migrating to the U S and, um, she says, I care about the border. And she and when she says that, she says, I care about the border. When she does it, I can't even do it. She does this really weird bobblehead thing. You know, usually we're looking for someone giving confirmation nods. I care about the border. You know, and the, the nod, if she's saying yes, it should happen on every word. But she's doing this and their head's going to the side and up and down. So I think that lets us know she's she's insecure. She's she's not sure about the answer. So I think that's what's happening here. We're seeing uh, the, her being her her classic self on this. We're seeing the classic uh, Kamala on this. Mark, what do you got? When I used to Google my name, it was amazing the amount of sensitive data that would come up. My address, phone number, and on the dark net, passwords, all for sale. That's not a great feeling, and it's certainly not safe at all. And here's why. Data brokers are selling our information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, your relatives, it's all out there. And so that's why I now use Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. Cleaning up my information not only helps reduce the amount of spam I get, but it protects me from hackers who could use this information to help them access my social media accounts, bank accounts, or other sensitive information. So I don't know if you saw this, but AT&T revealed that over 73 million customer records, both existing and former customers, were released on the dark web. They recommended those affected use strong passwords, monitor account activity, and consider credit freezes or fraud alerts from credit bureaus. So here's the key. You can let Aura handle it for you. And you can try Aura free by using our special behavior panel link. But Aura also does so much more than protecting you from the online threats that you can't see. It's really easy to set up so you don't have to download several different apps to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. You get everything at one affordable price. So let Aura handle all of your online security for you and your family so you can get on with the things that you enjoy with a lot of peace of mind. Here's an opportunity to stop people profiting from your private information. Go to aura.com forward slash TBP to start your two week free trial. Also in the link below. Click on it. Go take a look. Yeah, so she's pretty much ruined from moment one because she throws up her hands immediately on it. There's an immediate um, conceding to, to the to the attack. Uh, at that point, um, and she does that at, at some point. At some point, so she's she's conceded really the whole argument from moment one. And when somebody gets into uh, a question which they don't really have a good argument for, and they try logic, you see the logic fall apart. We'll see it with Trump as well. So you know, there's no bias here. It's like both of them are going to fail and succeed at stuff, and you're going to be able to see how they fail and how they succeed. So it throws up her hands there. Um, uh, and you're right, Scott, I haven't been to Europe. That's what we call a false equivalence. The two things are not. So that's a piece of, of logical fallacy, false equivalence. If I say I haven't been to Europe, then that is equivalent to not being to the border. Well, of course, the two things are so far apart n- geographically, and they're not the same thing as well. Europe is not a, is not a border. Of, of of anything really so it doesn't make any any sense is is the sense that you'd get but rhetorically we call it or, or in logic we call it false equivalence so we know she's destabilized on a logic point of view here 
However, she does manage to stabilize herself somewhat. I agree, Scott, there's that wobbly head, but she does do um, firm belief and she goes to parallel at that point. So there is some balance brought back to her. She's thrown herself off balance. She does get more balance on firm belief and good words to do that with. Um, go, but then um, goes to asymmetry. So we'll often you'll often see one hand go up into the air, into like a thought bubble or even higher into ecstatic. It's um it's a, a, a trope that she that she has and she goes uh um into care for that. I care about this. So again, off balance asymmetry, but it's a nice big grand gesture that people would 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 see. Then back to root causes and into the truth plane there, stable symmetry. So bad start, better end to it, but still some of the ending not as stable as it could be. Uh and, and also on a on a key issue here, immigration, key popular uh, issue. Is it a key issue in the swing states? Uh, there's three swing states where the presidency will really be won. I don't actually know whether it's a key issue there, but a key popular issue. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, you all had some really good points here. Uh, let's ju just in this video, you're going to see... A loss of fluency where she has trouble being fluent in her language, hesitation, hesitancy. You're going to see redirection. You're going to see a failed use of humor or an attempt at humor. And then there's deflection to not understanding the point when any reasonable person would understand that point that you haven't been to the border. I think maybe the average eight year old might understand that point, but uses she also changes words around quite a bit. And this is in her baseline. She uses migration instead of immigration or illegal immigration. That is the root cause of this. And we're going to get into Trump's deception baseline, but this is what to look for when it comes to Vice President Harris. We're going to look for deflection, talking about lots of details without mentioning them. So I'm going to say we, we discovered all these things and never talk about a single one of them. So lots of details, no actual mention of the details. And she'll do this while nodding to get the other person or people in the crowd to nod along with her. And you'll notice it's not working on Lester in this clip. The nodding is not working. Uh, there's loose and mistimed gestures with no rigidity to them. The, the gestures get a little more loose, a little more off center. And the more off-center and loose the gestures are, the more stress she's under. And this has been through every interview she's had, laughing and smiling, especially when it's not warranted, especially when it's not warranted. And there's uh, one of her other hallmarks is a complete non-answer to the initial question. So the question's here, and it's just a, a slice to the other fairway. And then there's freeze behavior that lasts about a second. And you'll see her facial expression and her body freeze up for one second while the processor is running. And all keep an eye out for that loss of fluency and that hesitation. And finally, phrase repetition, like you saw in this clip with her saying this whole, this whole, this whole thing about the border. Phrase repetition is her trying to form a coherent sentence and that's her processor running so you're going to see a lot of phrase repetition look for this in any future interview any future speech and especially in the debates if those happen coming up there's one other topic i wanted to uh, talk to you about but let me just quickly put a button okay. do you have any plans to visit the border I, i'm here in guatemala today i at some point you know i we are going to the border. We've been to the border. So you, this whole this whole this whole thing about the border, we've been to the border. We've been to the border. You haven't been to the border. I, and I haven't been to Europe. And I, I, mean, I don't I don't understand the point that you're making. I'm not discounting the importance of the border. Well, I, I, I mentioned it because I, even, I, I know Republicans have certainly come at you on this. But Democratic Congressman Cuellar as a border district has said to the, you and the president, come, you need, I care you need to see about, this. Listen, I care about what's happening at the border. I'm in Guatemala because my focus is dealing with the root causes of migration. There may be uh, some who think that that is not important, but it is my firm belief 
that if we care about what's happening at the border, we better care about the root causes and address them. And so that's what I'm doing. Will you accept the results of the election, regardless of who wins? Yes or no, please. If it's a fair and legal and good election, absolutely. I would have much rather accepted these, but the the fraud and everything else was ridiculous. And if you want, we'll have a news conference on it in a week. Or we'll have another one of these on in a week. But I will absolutely, there's nothing I'd rather do. It would be much easier for me to do that than I'm running again. I wasn't really going to run until I saw the horrible job he did. He's destroying our country. I would be very happy to be someplace else in a nice location someplace. And again, no indictments, no political opponent stuff, because it's the only way he thinks he can win. But unfortunately, it's driven up my numbers and driven them up to a very high level because the people understand it. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so first of all, straight off the bat there, uh, moderates there with the finger, stops the whole whole thing causes a halt to it, takes control of the situation. Um, if it's a fair, legal and good election, fair, legal and good election, really good batons on that, you know, conducting along to the rhythm of his speech. So feels very strongly about fair, legal and good election. But to your point, Chase, about specifics, like, well, what do you mean by that? Well, how would that look? Like, what would that, can you give me some detail? Like, what would cause it not to be fair? Or, and, it, and we might go, well, I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? But it's not obvious. It's not obvious if you're trying to make a real point. You maybe want, just like we needed from uh, Harris, we need some specifics as to what's the criteria you're talking about, or we'll just make them up in our own head, which is probably what's what he's trying to do there is go, well, you decide what, what that is because you have your idea. But what we need to know is what's his idea. Because the question here is, is will you accept the outcome of an election? Well, if it's fair and legal and a good election. Well, what do you mean good? Like define good, because if it's bad, you're not going to accept it. And that would be, you know, that might cause some interest. So uh, absolutely, he says, absolutely. But he strikes that out. He does a strikeout gesture on absolutely. Now, is that strikeout that he really means it? So he's striking it out because it, it seems to be contrarian to what he's saying there, but that might be his baseline that he does strikeouts on positives. I haven't seen that as his baseline. So I think he's negating the absolutely there. Um, fraud and everything else. Okay, I get fraud. Like what's, can you be specific about the everything else? Like, what do you mean by everything else? I mean, like everything else in the universe or have you got some specific ideas? And then a good questioner would go, um, you know, President Trump, uh, could you take us through the everything else on that and see whether he can get down to some uh, specifics there? Um, at a very high level, he says again, unspecific, and we get and we get fading facts from him there. His voice runs out on that as well. So he's um, uh, he is unspecific on this around uh, a really important thing, which is uh, which is when you hand over. Um, the presidency or when you accept the presidency or whether you accept that somebody else won it, there's a there's a, a, a general idea that it has to be accepted or all hell breaks loose. And we want to know, will our candidates accept the results? And he's being unspecific about this. Now, why might this be? Well, losing is very off brand for Trump. Very off brand. You'll remember to talk about losers all the time. He's a winner. He's a winner. He hates losers. I don't like losers. If he loses, it makes him a loser and he's meant to be a winner. So, of course, he's going to reject the idea at a really fundamental values level, personality level of ever being uh, the loser, which is fine. You can do anything you like in your own personality, but you wouldn't want it to, you know, eke out into the rest of the of the human race. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, great points. Absolutely great points. I hope people were taking notes for that. Uh, Trump's behavior is very different than Kamala. So it's going to be very interesting to see how they react to each other on a stage if she becomes the nominee, whether she's elected or some other process that I'm not educated about. 
that Trump has a few key ways that he responds to difficult questions here. The first thing that you're going to see is this regulator, as Greg and Scott call it. He lifts this finger up and starts to control the conversation. The next step for Trump is that he's going to put terms onto any deal that someone offers him. And he sees the world as a series of deals. So this question is a deal. And he uses language to introduce terms to the deal. Yes, if. I will be willing to accept this if. And here's the terms of the deal. So you're also going to see this accordion playing movement that he commonly makes with his hands. This isn't his deception baseline, but he's more likely to do this when he's feeling more pressure. And one final thing you've probably heard about uh, Trump's speaking style is that he speaks at around a seventh grade level, and this is not on accident. It, p- candidates who speak at a lower grade level, historically going back to the first televised uh presidential debate, uh, which was Kennedy and Nixon, are the winners of the debate. So when when you have a speaking style that communicates to those that grade level, there's clarity. Uh, it improves people's retention. Simple language is just easier to understand and complex words are just more confusing. There's an emotional connection and empathy increase. So when you use straightforward language, you seem more relatable and more trustworthy and people feel like you're you're talking to them and not at them. They also feel understood and valued. Then there's focus. So keeping it simple helps people to focus on your main point without getting lost in a bunch of details. Trust spikes up too. So speaking plainly shows honesty and transparency or the perception of it. And engagement is higher. Simple stories and simple examples are more engaging and easier to visualize. They stick in people's head better. And when people understand you easily, when you're confident, they feel more confident in their knowledge and they're more likely to act on their knowledge. And finally, the the last point here is speaking at this level increases comfort because it's familiar language. It feels comfortable. It reduces anxiety. People are more open to your message when they feel at ease, when they're comfortable hearing it. Scott, what do you got? Uh, Yeah, I agree with you. I think he does a great job at making things simple. And that's an art to be able to do that and to be able to. And and like you're saying, if you compare uh, Harris with Trump and those two things, she's always looking. She's always trying to to give this this uh, vibe out that she's thinking these wonderful things up and stuff. Whereas Trump just says, here's the way it is. This is what's happening. That's what's not a lot of not that he's not creative, but not a lot of of creative sprinkling of shiny stuff on top of whatever he's saying. Um, Einstein had this down because you could, if you took the, the theory, the special theory of relativity and you busted it as big as that thing is, if you busted it down to its simplest terms or the second simplest terms, it would be as an object approaches the speed of light, the energy of motion is converted into mass. And that takes this huge uh, theory and just bust it down into very small uh, little, something a lot of people can understand. But he always said, if, if an eighth grader doesn't, or an eight-year-old doesn't understand what you're saying, you don't know what you're talking about. So you could say, instead of saying that even that thing from, you know, as an object approaches the speed of light, the energy of motion is converted into mass, you could say, the faster something goes, the heavier it gets. And that's where Trump is in this. He knows how to break things down and make them super simple so anybody can understand them, like an eight-year-old can understand what he's talking about. Now, some of the things he's talking about here are things that an eight-year-old doesn't have any concept of as far as the subject matter. But when you break the the rest of it down, it's fairly simple. So that's, yeah, that's a, that's a good call. And also that that little regulator there, that's sort of, that's his way of putting a halt to things, even though everyone's going to listen to what he has to say. He doesn't need to regulate. And doesn't say, wait a minute. But he puts that up because he's saying, hang on, here it is. Here's the reason why. Wait just a minute. Because that's sort of an attention getter when people do that. People get up and they go, okay, here's what we're going to do. Or look at this. You use your illustrators to do to do that. So, he, But he's using a, uh, a regulator there. So brings things to a halt, even though they're not they're not out of hand or getting away from them. And then he starts telling uh, what he thinks about uh, the stuff when he says, hang on a second. Um, so his blink race is fairly fast, and that lets us know he's excited about this. I think his, his answer is, is ready. I don't think he prepares them by phrases or anything like that. I think he's got bullet points that he goes over and he can remember what the bullet points were and then talk on those. And uh, his illustrators are all on point. They land on time when they should. He's doing the classic Trump 
illustrators. All of his body language so far is classic Trump that, that we've seen. There's a few things missing in there, but all the all the classic uh, illustrators are in there. His voice is strong. His cadence is is uh, fairly stable in there. It speeds up a little bit in some spots, but not all of them. And like Mark was saying, it it, it gets kind of quiet in some places as well. So not that he's 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 being deceptive, but he may not be as sure about that and may not have thought those things as, through as thoroughly as the first part that he's talking about. And then you have Biden over there looking like he's wondering if the stove got turned off before he left the White House. So that, that, that situation has been taken care of, whatever. But that's it's interesting to see somebody that alive and, and, and that perky next to somebody on the same screen is just sitting there looking into nothingness. It's kind of sad, I think. Greg, what do you got? I'm going to stick with the same thing. I'm going to give you a formula, six steps, and I'll talk through them and I'll go back and list them by number. He's, let's just start off by saying, I'm not saying either Harris or Trump is being deceptive in either of these. What I'm saying is they're in conflict and they're dealing with that conflict, whether the conflict is caused because they're not prepared, whether it's caused because they're telling something is not true. We're just looking for how do we know that they're doing that. And so here's six steps. First, he's going to answer the part of the question he wants to. That's the reason I think we see the finger. Boom, I'm going to answer this, but wait. Then he conditions the questions. Mark, you hit it dead on with nonspecific information. He's got a lot of nonspecific conditions that he puts on it. They're, they're meaningful to him or to somebody who's listening, but they're not part of it. Then he's framing that down. He's going to narrow it down to the part of the question he wants to respond to. That's the only part he answers. But when he does answer it, he answers it emphatically. Absolutely. Then he moves to a cause that people can get behind. I wouldn't have done it in the beginning, except. And then he redirects and starts talking about that new topic. So watch for these six steps. One, answers the part of the question he wants to. Two, conditions the question with nonspecific conditions. Three, frames to the part he's willing to respond to. Four, answers emphatically. Five, moves to a cause that people can get behind. Six, redirects to the topic he wants to discuss. It's a formula, and if you go watch, a lot of the times he's feeling uncomfortable, you'll see those same steps. Will you accept the results of the election, regardless of who wins? Yes or no, please. If it's a fair and legal and good election, absolutely. I would have much rather accepted these but the, the fraud and everything else was ridiculous. And if you want, we'll have a news conference on it in a week. Or we'll have another one of these on a, in a week. But I will absolutely, there's nothing I'd rather do. It would be much easier for me to do that than I'm running again. I wasn't really going to run until I saw the horrible job he did. He's destroying our country. I would be very happy to be someplace else in a nice location someplace. And again... No indictments, no political opponent stuff, because it's the only way he thinks he can win. But unfortunately, it's driven up my numbers and driven them up to a very high level because the people understand it. Cash bail. It's a really simple point. You get arrested. Let's say somebody gets arrested for a, a nonviolent felony. Let's say it's shoplifting, grand theft, something of great value. You get arrested because it's a crime. You get charged because it's a crime. And then you go before a court and the judge says, OK, according to this piece of paper, the bail schedule, you got to put up twenty thousand dollars to get out before trial. Otherwise, you sit in until the trial comes, which might be weeks, months or years. So who's got twenty thousand dollars sitting around? Most Americans don't. Then let's say that that woman's family members are in the courtroom. They'll go across the street to the bail bondsman that is across the street from almost every courthouse in America. Bail bondsman says, I'll give you the $20,000, but you got to put up 10%, and you're not going to get that back. Well, that's $2,000. Most Americans don't have $2,000 sitting around. So what ends up happening, either they've got a big bar on steel to get that $2,000, or their family member just sits in jail for the next weeks, months, or years, or what is equally likely is that that person might say, the lawyer might say, well, if you plead guilty, you can get credit for time served. And then even if they have a defensible case, knowing they've got children at home that'll be unsupervised, knowing they have a job that if they miss this much time, they're going to lose it, they might plead guilty even though they had a defensible case. None of those scenarios is right, especially since each scenario is determined 
by the amount of money you have in your bank and not based on the crime you committed. So what we're proposing instead is that instead of a cash bail system that is like a debtor's prison, we would have a system where you get out based on an assessment of your risk to society, your risk to the community. That just makes more sense, not to mention being more fair. This is about economic justice. Because literally, the difference between sitting in jail or not is how much money you have. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Uh, let's address a, a quick note here. Vice President Harris is very passionate about this and has been for a long time. I would feel like a fool not to simply include that some people think whether you sit in a jail or not is about money, but that's a big oversimplification. Just to make this point clear, judges consider tons of factors individually when they're deciding bail and the severity of the crime, uh, the flight risk, uh, public safety concerns, criminal history. There's also bail schedules that provide a lot of these guidelines and judges can adjust this. This is, uh, uh, this is their discretion. So uh, it might be more, beneficial to work on judge discretion, but they even consider your ability to pay and sometimes offer alternatives like uh, ankle monitors and stuff like that. So it's not just about how much money you have. It's kind of a nuanced process with a lot of safeguards to make sure that it's fair. But when, when Kamala is telling stories, especially hypothetical stories, hypothetical ones especially, she's always more confident and connected to the viewers. Watch her face, her eyebrows. She means every word that she says here, which is a huge contrast to what we saw earlier when she was being avoidant and deceptive and deflecting away from answering very simple questions. And if Harris team wants to get her to win a potential upcoming debate, they're going to use her strengths instead of teaching her new speaking methods to avoid questions, getting her speaking in hypothetical scenarios and it, You'll be golden. And in debate, the more numbers and statistics you use to try to build yourself up, the more people will fail to identify or connect with you. People don't uh, create big, beautiful imagery in their head from numbers and statistics. And that's why we don't see Trump doing that a lot. And uh, getting her to go hypothetical, stay away from numbers and statistics, paint pictures in people's heads, uh, and she'll stand a much better shot. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so you're right. All, all of these are complex issues. And the key here is, can you boil it down to something simple for the swing vote, which is the only thing that matters, the swing vote to understand which way they would go? How does she do here, though? This is somewhat in the in the past. And we've got a kind of a radic we've got a kind of position ourselves away from that music that's going on at the same time, the images yeah. that we're going on and try and work out. So what is it you're saying here and how are you saying it and how might that affect the swing vote? Because listen, if you're a voter now in the US, you probably know which way you're going. OK, and it's probably how you've always gone unless something different has happened in your life recently within the last two years that's radically um, changed the environment around you. And at that point, you might be going, God, I don't know, I need something else to help me with my life. And, and you may well be in that swing vote. And only three, three states matter in the swing vote, as I can understand it at the moment. Look, she's in a situation here where there's no pressure on her. So we're seeing her under no pressure here. It's... Um, it's a well thought out argument. You might disagree with the argument, but it's yeah. a well thought out argument here. And here's why. Um, what we call the logos and the pathos and the ethos uh, is, is there. So, so the logos there, the logic there is, is simple, right and fair. It's simple, right and fair. Now, you might look at the complexity of it and go, well, hang on, it isn't that simple. But she's going to position it as simple, just like Trump might be able to position something as simple, way more simple than it actually is. She's saying simple, right and, and fair. Um, it, uh, if you have money, you can plead not guilty is the logic that's there. Now, as Chase just put forward, there are many factors in there. But if I tried to get elected on the many factors, we'd never be able to have a debate. Like it would last more than an hour. You can't win over a public. Here's what I, we always used to say when I was running these kind of campaigns is when the swing vote are listening to this in a debate, they are doing the ironing, they are making T 
tea. They're making fish fingers. They're trying to eat their peas. Yeah, they're doing they're doing other stuff at the same time. They're trying to live their difficult life that's just changed and understand your argument. So it can't be um, ac- your argument can't be accurate. It's got to be simple enough that it feeds the idea that the swing vote has and makes them feel safer, more comfortable with the world around them. So you might disagree with the argument, but you're probably not the swing vote. So actually, you just don't matter. Nobody cares about anybody who already knows how they're going to vote. You, you, you're null and void in it. Um, the pathos of it, which is the feeling of it, women, family, Okay, women that she she particularly focuses there on a on a a woman who has a family, and then she goes for most Americans, most Americans. Now that's a that's a, a generalization. We don't think most Americans will 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 agree with this or 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 understand this. She's telling us most. Well, Trump will bring up the idea of most people. In, in the next one that we see. So every politician uses this. Why? Simplifies this. If Because the other idea is, Chase, we bring up a statistic. 79.5% of Americans, like, it's like, then you've got people arguing the statistic. Well, where did you get your statistic from? So you have to go most. But it's not true. It's not accurate. Now, is it a lie? Well, it's just not accurate. That's the thing. It's not accurate because you cannot let accuracy mess up your good story and she's telling a great story here now here's where she really brings in something i think brilliant maybe a bit of ahead of its 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 time here but my guess is is we'll see more of this from her it just makes more sense she says it just makes more sense now the reason i think that's brilliant is that it just makes sense trope is at the moment the trope of conservatives across the world it just makes sense and they're getting elected based on this it just makes sense and she's whether she knows this or not co-opted that and one of the skills to getting the swing vote is co-opt the moderate stance of your opponent and she's doing it here uh i think uh we might see more of that that to your point chase this might be the way she starts to win that swing vote is with it just makes more sense it just makes sense the one thing she can't be framed at is a progressive Democrat from California. That will not win her the swing vote, but it just makes sense. Could win her the swing vote. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Mark, it's funny. I just told somebody the other day, Bill Clinton won an election with just a few words. You know what those were? It's the economy, stupid. Yeah. Remember? That's what cost George H.W. Bush the presidency was the economy. And Carville came up with that thing and they just kept saying it over and over and over and drove that point home. So it's simple messages to get across. What I want to do now is to compare what she does here with what she did when I said there were six steps. And you can see why she wants to move on to a holy cause and move there because that's her wheelhouse. Whether you agree with her message here or not, that's her wheelhouse. Mark, to your point, she's straight down the center. If she had her hands up, they're probably doing this. She's driving to her point. I'm going to run quickly back over. We would look for chaff and evasive and words evading her, smiling and nodding to get agreement with some useless information without substance, losing control, getting wooden, starting to blink a lot and lose and have fight or flight, feigning misunderstanding, and then finally that cackling laughter. We don't see any of that, not one of those things. If you now watch her, she's clear, she's concise. There's no amusement. She has clear illustrators. She's making her point. She's got contempt at the right times in her face for the issues. She's got clear, contained, downtone telling. She's passionate, uses emphatics. You're not going to get that money back. There's logical speech, regardless of whether you agree with it or not, there's a logical path. There's consistent cadence to what she's saying and long and complex sentences with a logical building progression. That is how she wins an election. She gets in and she gets on a topic and does that. Then she wins people over. That other stuff she was doing in the beginning in that nervous place is a tough one. Now, Trump is masterful at branding people, so it'd be interesting to see the two of them debating. That's all I got. All right. Well, I'll go. I thought you did. Yeah. No, not yet. No. thought you did. Sorry. Yeah. Did I? I, I'll hand it back to you. thought you did. No, I haven't gone yet. Maybe not. Okay. I went to okay. Chase. Chase went to Mark, and then Mark went to you. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Go okay. So anyway, uh, this is the only time I've ever seen uh, Harris with this much conviction. 
This is something she believes in. And I think this is what's gotten her where she is today. Because at some point when she comes along to, to, to sell whatever her, her um, bill is or whatever it is she's doing or what she's trying to get across, man, she was pretty good at it right there. You got to admit, I mean, she's selling that thing and it's working, you know? So, and her illustrators are on point. Everything, everything looks good. Everything looks as it should look. So her illustrators are on point. Her, um, her confirmation nods are where they should be. Everything is happening the way it should. And I've never seen her squint and move forward before. So this is the first time I've actually seen this. So I think this is something she, she feels like she, she believes this, she believes this is the road to go down. Her cadence and her and her and her tone are strong. Her volume is good, and they they really don't waver. You know, so I think that shows a lot of confidence. And again, going back to conviction, she's into this big time. So she says, literally, the difference in sitting in jail um, is not uh, how much money you ha- is not. Um, literally, the difference in sitting in jail or not is how much money you've got. And when she says that, you'll notice she gets a little bit quieter there at the end. So, and I think maybe she doesn't realize that the the difference is not committing the crime. That's the only thing. That's the only thing she she doesn't add into there is the person commit. If they wouldn't commit the crime, they wouldn't be there. And like going back to Chase's points about how those things are broken down with the judge, how those things are everything is looked into from your finances to your family to everything like that when they make those decisions. So it's nothing um, out of the ordinary to have those things taken care of. So, but the point she's making. I, she totally believes in. I think we're seeing her be her here. We're seeing the the solid person she is, or the real person she is here. So you're right, Scott, because she she missed out a key argument there. If she'd have started with "You're innocent until you're proven guilty," there you go. She started right. with. I think she started with. You know, you've she, this woman has stole has shoplifted. So she'd already framed her as guilty. Rather than oh, innocent yeah. until proven guilty, if she'd have if she'd have changed that, she may have had an even better argument for yeah. it. Or certainly, better, you, but, you but wouldn't be able to go, "Hey, but hang on, this is a guilty person," you know. But, yeah. but her point still yeah. carries because oh, yeah. even if I did something tomorrow, and you know, I have enough money to get out on bail. Of course, to your point, Chase, this is why it's so complex, and no one sentence covers it. They would also set my bail higher. <laughs> you know, it's just the way it works. Right? Yeah. 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 Issue of cash bail. It's a really simple point. You get arrested. Let's say somebody gets arrested for a, a nonviolent felony. Let's say it's shoplifting, grand theft, something of great value. You get arrested because it's a crime. You get charged because it's a crime. And then you go before a court and the judge says, OK, according to this piece of paper, the bail schedule, you got to put up $20,000 to get out before trial. Otherwise, you sit in until the trial comes, which might be weeks, months or years. So who's got $20,000 sitting around? Most Americans don't. Then let's say that that woman's family members are in the courtroom. They'll go across the street to the bail bondsman that is across the street from almost every courthouse in America. Bail bondsman says, I'll give you the $20,000, but you got to put up 10%, and you're not going to get that back. Well, that's $2,000. Most Americans don't have $2,000 sitting around. So what ends up happening, either they've got a big bar on steel to get that $2,000, or their family member just sits in jail for the next weeks, months, or years, or what is equally likely is that that person might say, the lawyer might say, well, if you plead guilty, you can get credit for time served. And then even if they have a defensible case, knowing they've got children at home that'll be unsupervised, knowing they have a job that if they miss this much time, they're going to lose it, they might plead guilty even though they had a defensible case. None of those scenarios is right, especially since each scenario is determined by the amount of money you have in your bank and not based on the crime you committed. So what we're proposing instead is that instead of a cash bail system that is like a debtor's prison, we would have a system where you get out based on an assessment of your risk to society, your risk to the community. That just makes more sense, not to mention being more fair. This is about economic justice. Because literally, the difference between sitting in jail or not is how much money you have. Take abortion. For 52 years, people wanted to get rid of Roe v. Wade. And the people that wanted to do it were legal scholars, 
lawyers, policy, everybody wanted it to go back into the state system, not the federal system. Let the states decide. Let the states decide. The people decide. Let the states decide. For 52 years, they fought it. I was able to get it done with the appointment of great justices, three great justices, plus others that joined them, as you know. And we don't have to go into all the names, but they're great. And they, were, they had the courage to end Roe v. Wade, which really meant, from a legal standpoint, it now goes back to the states. And now the states are deciding. And by the way, in many cases, like Ohio, it became, if you want to use the word liberal or progressive, it was more liberal or progressive than people would have thought. But the people of Ohio decided. The people of Kansas decided. The people are now deciding. And it's taken it off the shoulders of the federal government. Always they wanted it to be decided by the states. And Roe v. Wade didn't do that. It put it into the federal government. So now states are voting on it. And in many cases, it's it's more progressive or I like the term liberal. You know, they want to get away from the word liberal, I guess. But uh, it's it's more liberal in many cases, not in all cases. In some cases, they're going the other direction. But the people are deciding. And in many ways, it's a beautiful thing to watch. So... They wanted to, for 52 years, move it back to the states. That's why they wanted to fight Roe v. Wade. Then about 10 or 12 years ago, it started getting more complex. They were talking about lots of different things. But remember this. The radicals, in many ways, are the Democrats of this issue because they want to have abortion be okay in the eighth month and the ninth month and even after birth. It's okay. All right, Greg, what do you got? So let's do the same thing here we did with Harris. Let's say, what are the six formula steps that he used in the beginning when he was uncomfortable and evasive? Answered the part of the question he wanted to. Condition the question with nonspecific conditions. Frame to the parties willing to respond to. Answers emphatically. Moves to a cause people can get behind. Redirects to a new topic. We didn't see that here. We see long, complex messages with qualification Support. So when he says this person, he p calls out what kind of a person he's talking about, how long they've been in the business, and, and, and. He just goes on and on with it. He's downward in telling. His voice tone is going down. He's not doing hold on, wait. His trademark body language, that air accordion. By the way, it's funny. I did one based on him a while ago in his youth. He was not doing that until late 80s. He started doing this in the late 80s. But that air accordion became part of him then. Then emphatic language, great hyperbole. He's using those kinds of terms. Great this. It was a great thing. It was that. He's doing that when he's on the positive side. He caveats to fill in examples. If I go to Ohio, look what happened. That's not like he does when he's under stress style. Then he explains his, his position with clear language and punctuates his thought and restates things. We didn't see any of that when he was uncomfortable. We saw him avoiding the topic and moving off to a new topic. Scott, what do you got? All right. I, I think this is a, a great example of the uh, Trump who's not under attack. This is something where he knows he's in a safe zone, like he was with Dr. Phil. These are delivered similar, similarly to those, his answers in this. And um, I, think, I think he's just re relaying what, he, what he's thinking about or, or what he thinks on it. Obviously, that's what you want as an answer when you ask somebody what to think about. It. But I think he's relaying instead of like thinking stuff up and making specific points to, oh, I need to champion this. I need to champion that. I think he's just talking pretty much. His blink rate is stable. Not a lot of eye, uh, eyelid flutter at all. So I think his cadence stays uh, fairly stable. So I think he's confident with, with what he's saying again. Uh, he, he's not worried. He's not under attack like he was. He wasn't under attack in the first one, but that was one that got a little worked up. So his voice tone is different. When he's getting worked up or somebody's attacking him, his voice tone gets a little bit rougher, a little bit louder, and he talks a little bit faster. And there's a big difference in the two when you listen to him one or the other. There's not as much. A couple of times you hear him do almost go up like, yeah. You know, almost, his voice goes up so high, it almost, it's like the Jerry Seinfeld. What? That kind of thing. So... I, I think this is um, a good a good example of him being more relaxed, and when he's not under, when he's not under, under attack. So when he's in the defense mode, all this stuff is different. Every bit of this stuff is different when he's when he's fighting somebody. In other words, that's the way I always term it. So I think it, I, I think this is a good one, and uh, just showing the, the two examples of the way Trump is. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, interesting one. So um, again. 
unspecific, but simple. And and just as Chase has been saying, simple is key here. But of course, the simpler you get, uh, the more you're going to, the argument or the, the logos doesn't really make any sense. People, he says. Okay, well, which people? What people are you talking about? Well, it gets a little more specific. Legal scholars, lawyers, polit, and he doesn't finish the word, politicians. And he's not telling us which ones, which legal scholars, what you, what scholarly works are you talking about? And of course, because that would get academic and you'll lose if you get academic. And he wants to win. He wants to be a winner, just as Harris wants to be a winner. And the more detailed you get and specific you get, the more likely, to chase his point, you will use longer words and you will therefore lose. So people, he says, uh, and gives legal scholars, lawyers, poly, and doesn't finish that. Everyone, he says, everyone. Well, that that's not accurate. It's not everyone, right? Everybody? No. Like, which specific people? So the moment you simplify, you become less accurate and more likely to the, to the, to the crowd that don't support you to come across as being deceptive. But we've got to understand everybody will be generalizing in order to win the deal. In order to win it, you're going to have to generalize somewhat. Great justices, he says, great justices, plus others. Which others? What others are you talking about? Uh, well, he does. Um, we, we don't have to go into all the names, he says. We don't have to go into all the names. Um, well, you could. I mean, you could if you wanted to. You could give us all the names if you wanted to. But but why even mention that you don't want to go in? Why? Because he, he needs to reduce it. to So he's in this constant battle between... I did, so because this is stuff he did. This is not a thought experiment like Kamal Harris. This is something that he did, and he's in this fight between his personality, which wants to go, here's all the people I got together, got the deal done, I did this, let me tell you their names. They're really great people. They're really good people. I want to tell you, and knowing that won't sell, I need to get across the simple point here. We don't have to go into all the names, but they were great. They were great. That's all you need to know. They were great. Then he really, um, well, let's 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 say his his logos here is defederalization equals democratization equals liberalization. That's the piece of logic he's saying. If you defederalize, it's more democratic, and being more democratic is more classically liberal. We'll come back to that because again, he's going to start this process of co-opting the language. Of, of the opponent in order to win that, win that swing vote. Uh, the pathos of it, he goes for courage, beautiful thing to watch, the courage of it and a beautiful thing to watch. So everyone is great and there's courage and there's beauty in this. And then the, the uh, ethos of this, the, the, the personal sense of, of, of ethics is if you are liberal, you're not radical. Now, this is really key because he's trying to take the progressive trope of anybody conservative is radical. Okay, so he's going, hang on, I'll, I'll take this idea that I'm liberal and therefore can't possibly be radical. So the more he talks about defederalization, the more we can link that with democratization, the more we can go, well, that's really classically liberal. And if you're classically liberal, there's no way that you can be radical and therefore he's wiping out the opponent's attack situation uh, in terms of, of, of debate. That's that's a clever that's a clever move. Now, is it clever enough for the swing vote? Well, swing vote in certain states, if it's a young female swing vote, this is a key issue for them. This is a key issue. It's not a it's not, as I understand it, a general key issue across the popular vote, but in some of the swing votes for the young female voters, which are swing voters, it's a key issue. Has he done enough there to go? By, by overturning Roe Wade, what I actually got, got to do was to be not radical in that. That's not being radical. Well, we'll see. We'll see if he, if he gets asked those questions again, and we'll see how that swing vote uh, go with that one. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? It, this is a great example of both Trump and Harris being confident and straightforward with answers. Greg and Scott picked these clips out and a fantastic job finding these for, for contrast. 
So Trump tilts his head like you see in this clip, almost without exception when he's being confident and he's confident in his answers. And when Trump is confident in something, you're going to see increased eye contact, hand movements that are timed with his speech. You're going to see more symmetry and things lining up. And when I say symmetry, this is not to say that asymmetry is deceptive. I'm only saying that his level of what I would call gestural symmetry increases with his confidence. One thing to look for in the debate or any other appearance is, and this is something you can spot a mile away when it comes to stress and confidence in what the candidates are saying is both of them, Trump and Harris have one trait in common when it comes down to how confident they are in their answers. That trait is the amount of vocal tone variability or VTV in this line of work. How much variability is in their speech? Is it going up and down? Are they be, are, if they're becoming more monotone, you can just listen to this debate just with your ears and it's going to sound that way where you can predict who's confident and who's not just looking at variability. This is the one of most well-demonstrated behavioral cues of stress and confidence for both of them. So if you were looking for one thing to look for in a potential upcoming debate, this would be what my pick, the, the horse that I would bet on, would be the one thing to look for. So one more thing that they both have in common is to use the interviewer's name to reestablish control if they think they're losing control at all. So listen for that as well. That's all I got. Take abortion. For 52 years, people wanted to get rid of Roe v. Wade. And the people that wanted to do it were legal scholars, lawyers, politicians. Everybody wanted it to go back into the state system, not the federal system. Let the states decide. Let the states decide. The people decide. Let the states decide. For 52 years, they fought it. I was able to get it done with the appointment of great justices, three great justices, plus others that Join them, as you know, and we don't have to go into all the names, but they're great. And they were, they had the courage to end Roe v. Wade, which really meant from a legal standpoint, it now goes back to the states. And now the states are deciding. And by the way, in many cases, like Ohio, it became, if you want to use the word liberal or progressive, it was more liberal or progressive than people would have thought. But the people of Ohio decided. The people of Kansas decided. The people are now deciding. And it's taken it off the shoulders of the federal government. Always they wanted it to be decided by the states. And Roe v. Wade didn't do that. It put it into the federal government. So now states are voting on it. And in many cases, it's it's more progressive or I like the term liberal. You know, they want to get away from the word liberal, I guess. But uh, it's it's more liberal in many cases, not in all cases. In some cases, they're going the other direction. But the people are deciding. And in many ways, it's a beautiful thing to watch. So... They wanted to, for 52 years, move it back to the states. That's why they wanted to fight Roe v. Wade. Then about 10 or 12 years ago, it started getting more complex. They were talking about lots of different things. But remember this. The radicals, in many ways, are the Democrats of this issue because they want to have abortion be okay in the eighth month and the ninth month and even after birth. We've looked at these videos and talked about what we thought was happening. Mark, what do you think is happening overall? What are you seeing? Yeah, this was great to, to watch. Great videos that you guys picked. Uh, great fake debate uh, going going on here. Uh, what what should we look for going forward in the in the debate if if it happens? Look, an hour is a long time in politics at the moment. So who knows? Who knows what will go on? Uh, as as we stand today, they are in the popular vote. They are pretty much level pegging with each other. That's the way Trump and Biden were, uh, according to the majority of polls before the debate. So it just shows you what a debate can do, what a debate can do, because the last debate with Biden took him took him out the running completely, completely. So it'd be great to see a debate here because we have, according to many good polls, absolute in popular vote level peggers. I think they are both of them like they, they both have the machinery and the accuracy and the delivery to put up a really good fight against each other. So if the bit debate goes ahead, it will be a decent enough 
battle that I think it'll be worth watching. And I think the public will watch this maybe even more closely than the Biden-Trump uh, debate. So I hope this, all I hope is this might be helpful for you to watch that debate and, and decide what you think, because that's really all that matters, especially if you don't, if you really don't know. There's people who say they don't know, but they know. But if you really don't know right now, you are the most important people in the presidential election. And quite frankly, everybody else, whatever they think, just don't matter at all. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so two big things to look for if this debate happens, especially if this debate happens. Two huge things you want to look for is whose body language is flowing more and whose face is more expressive. Both of them have more fluid body language and more flowing facial expressions that go along with what they're saying when they're confident. And the moment one of them starts lacking this facial affect, these facial expressions, and starts getting more monotone in their delivery, that's most likely when you're seeing a high degree of stress. And when it comes down to it, the way that Americans historically have chosen the winner of any debate is the person who looks more certain than the other person. And that's that's it. Who looks more certain and who looks more followable, as uh, to quote what Mark often says. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Chase, first of all, I love the stuff you're talking about with voice tone and loss of facial movement because those are great indicators of stress. Don't mean deception. What we know is that John F. Kennedy won the debate against Nixon to people who were watching and people who were listening thought Nixon won for that very reason, because he was sweating and he was uncomfortable and all that. Look, I think where we're at now, Mark, I think you're dead on. We're so polarized as a nation that people are probably in two camps. There might be a handful of you who this will make a difference to, how the person's responding and what they're saying. What we set out to do is to give you a set of tools. I'm sure some of you are gonna say, you know, Greg's of this and Chase's of that and Scott's, that's okay, say whatever you want, we don't care. We, whatever you get off your chest, what we want you to do is have a set of tools. What we try to do is show you what they look like when they're stressed, when they're having a difficult time answering a question. And that should tell you there's a process going on inside their head versus just forthcoming information that you saw in the second one. I think there's there are two very different stories, two very different styles, but you can see similarities in how they respond. And Chase, I think you rolled that up nicely. Scott, what do you got? I really like these because I think it shows us when they're being like we were talking about earlier, shows you when they're evading something or they're not sure about something. And it shows you when they're spot on and for dang sure know about something or into it or being and are convicted and, and the whole they're committed to what they're talking about. So I think it's a great example of that, because if uh, like you guys are saying, the, the debate happens, then we're going to be able to look at those. If you go back through these. I think this is this is really important because you're going to be able to see when they're being serious about something and when they're evading something to get to make everything smaller. So I think it, I think this is a great one. All right, fellas. See you next time.